Good morning, friends. It is good to be, good to be in the house of the Lord together today. I'm so glad that we're all here. One of the things that we come together to do every week is to magnify the Lord together. Out of the overflow of what's already been happening in his presence with us individually all week long. So as we begin today, uh, I'm going to invite you to do something a little different. I'm going to invite you to stand and read along with me. You'll, you'll see it on the screen. And for those of you watching online, I'm going to invite you to do this at home, to read aloud with me from Psalm 34 as we magnify the Lord together. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. We've come into the presence of the Lord today to lift up his name. And we invite you to do that as we continue in worship together. Let's worship the Lord. sings 
seated.
Join me as we speak to our Lord. Father God, we're so grateful that we can come and be in your presence today. Wherever we are, Lord, it makes no difference. We can come and be in your presence. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are the almighty God. There is no other. That you are faithful. That you are strong that your love does truly endure forever. And we seek, Father God, this morning to give you the honor and praise that you deserve, whether it be through the songs that we sing, the words we speak, the word that is spoken over us this morning. Father, we just want you to be held high. We want you to be glorified, for you are alone are worthy of that praise, honor, and glory. And Lord, so we draw near to you today, Lord, giving you thanks for the fact that you have been with each and every one of us each and every day this week. It matters not what we face. You have been there with us, and you know and you understand, and we give you praise for that. Now, Lord, speak to our hearts today, whether it's through the music or the word. Speak to each of us individually and remind us, Lord, of your great love and your great mercy. And we'll give you all the praise for that, Lord. 
Now I'll speak through Joy as she comes this morning. Give her your words for us that we might listen, hear, and apply them. And we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It is always, always good to be in the presence of the people of God. But even more importantly, it is good to be in his presence. It's good to come together and sit at his feet. But the hope is that this is not the moment in your week where you're in the presence of the Lord, but that you're regularly sitting at his feet. So what happens when we get here is just the extension of that, that every moment that you've spent with him learning and listening and weeping and rejoicing all comes together in this moment where we bring all of that together and we surrender it to the Lord. We've been journeying through Acts, so whether you are watching online and you have been at home or you've been here with us in the building, uh, we have been walking through a pivotal book where God is opening our eyes to the transformation of what worship really looks like and what it means to be a part of the restored and redeemed community of God uh, after the story of Jesus. So this is the picture of a new church. And if you've been journeying with us at all, what you're discovering in the book of Acts, what I hope you're discovering, is that God is all about shifting our paradigm. He's all about changing our viewpoint. Literally, last week, we talked about what it would look like if we would take the blinders off of our eyes, or maybe God wanted to remove some scales, so that we could begin to see differently what it looks like to be a part of this redeemed community. Well, that transformational vision continues today. And before we step into the text together, I want to read over you a portion of Acts chapter 10. And I invite you now to just posture yourself in whatever way is best for you to receive and hear the word of the Lord. And begin as you listen to ask the question, what is it, God, that you want me to hear today? Acts chapter 10, and we'll begin in verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened, and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back into heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And the men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion, He's a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. This is the word of God for God's people. And we are exceedingly thankful for it. Would you take just a moment now this morning and ask the Holy Spirit, what part of that passage does God want you to hear today?
As I've been sitting with this text all week, several things have come to my mind. It's, it's been hard, really, to narrow the place where God might bring us a word of challenge today. But a little bit of history is probably necessary so you can understand the context of what you heard today. The Cliff Note version goes like this. Peter has been ministering and has landed in the city of Joppa. He's staying in the home of a man named Simon who's a tanner. And while Peter is there, he receives a vision while he's up on the rooftop praying. It's lunchtime. That's the sixth hour of the day. That's noon. And he's hungry. You've been there. I know you have. Sometimes we call it hangry, right? Sometimes we're praying just to get to the meal. But sometimes in a season of fasting or when we're hungry and we begin to pray, it opens up an opportunity for God to speak to us in a way that previously he hasn't before. Not because God doesn't want to speak to us, but sometimes we let things get in the way. If Peter's appetite had gotten in the way of prayer time, he would have missed a revelation. A revelation not just for him, friends, but today's text has everything to do with the fact that we're sitting here today. It's one of the most pivotal moments in the book of Acts. In some ways, equal to or even more significant than the moment that we saw Saul have on the road to Damascus last week. And here's why. Because while Peter is praying, he receives a vision from the Lord. And for all intents and purposes, when we read this text in Acts, we want to read that this is about food. You can go all the way back to the Old Testament and see that there are strict rules about what food that God followers can eat and they can eat. And one of the biggest arguments in the early church was who could eat what and when and why. One of the reasons that Jewish people were so resistant to people who were not from the original tribe of Israel coming into the family of God was that they had different practices. They ate different things. They did different things. They hadn't been through all the rituals that the people of Israel had been through to be a part of God's chosen people. Peter had been raised in this tradition. So as this vision is happening and he sees all the animals he could possibly see in this giant blanket that's descending from the sky, he hears a voice that invites him to select from anything on the sheet to kill and eat. And his immediate response is, no way, Lord, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, 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 no. I don't know what's going on here, but I have never... I have never stepped outside the boundary of what your law says that I can do. I don't touch things that aren't clean. I don't touch things that are impure. Not going to happen. But a voice speaks from heaven and says something to Peter that we absolutely can't ignore. It will hopefully resonate with you in just a moment. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. I don't want you to miss that verse. Verse 15, I'm going to read it again. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. This story is really about so much more than food. But I have to just tell you on the human side of things, on the fleshly side of things, as I read this story, I could feel Peter's tension. I don't understand, Lord. I've been following you faithfully. You, you, you're now back at the right hand of the Father. I'm down here trying to figure this out all by myself. I don't know what this means. Yes, it's lunchtime, but I'm not touching that stuff. But did you catch in the text that this happens three times? Peter has a thing about threes. Have you noticed? Right? Three times a denial. Three times on the beach with Jesus. Do you love me? Do you love me? And now three times. Kill and eat. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Three times he has to have this conversation. And I think there's a reason why. 
I think it's because sometimes when God wants to send us a message, we just don't get it the first time. And he loves us enough to come back to us again and maybe again to make sure that we hear what he's saying. But Peter, much like us, doesn't know immediately what this means. He's hungry, he's praying, he's seen a vision, he's confused by it, and twice in the text it tells us he's wondering, he's perplexed, he's confused in his spirit about what it is that he's just seen and what it could mean, and while he is still trying to sort it all out, some people show up from out of town, and they've come just for him. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, Peter, the guests that are arriving, they're a part of all of this. I want you to go greet them. And when they invite you to go with them, I want you to go. Let me dial it back and tell you why all of this is a big deal. These three men, you find out from the end of the story, have been sent by a man named Cornelius. He's a part of the Italian cohort. He's a centurion. He's also, when you read at the beginning of Acts chapter 10, a god fearing man. In fact, scripture says that Cornelius has led his entire household to know the Lord. He gives generously and continuously without reservation alms for the poor. And he is a man who continually prays. All evidences of a life of someone who is pursuing the things of God. But Cornelius is not a Jew. Cornelius is welcome to worship God, but he's not welcome in the family of God because Cornelius was not raised with all of the traditions and all of the rituals and all of the practices that are necessary to become a part of the nation of Israel. And here's what Peter and every other Jew of his day and the Jews that preceded him for generations were stuck on. If you weren't circumcised, if you weren't baptized, if you weren't regularly bringing sacrifices before the Lord, then you weren't in. Didn't matter how much you prayed. Didn't matter what you gave. Didn't matter that you recognized that God was the only God above all gods, that there was no other God but Yahweh. You weren't a part of the family. And the greatest division in the early church was that after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell and people were beginning to hear the good news of the gospel, of the life and death and resurrection and coming again of Jesus Christ, there was a big dividing line right down the middle of the church. And it had everything to do with your background, with your race, if you will, with your history. And they were making separation in a place where God, from the beginning, was trying to bring things together. If you remember back to the message that Stephen preached that got him in a whole heap of trouble, one of the things that he was saying regularly was, you worship your history and you worship your ritual, but you've forgotten how to worship God. And there were a whole slew of people outside of the nation of Israel. They were called Gentiles, a whole slew of people who had recognized the power of God but weren't welcome in. But I want you to know that it wasn't this moment with Peter and Cornelius where God said, hey, I'm going to let you in. God had revealed from the beginning of time that same forefather in Abraham, the same history that these Jews had worshipped all along. God had said from the very beginning his intention was to bless all people. You go back to Genesis chapter 17 and you hear God say to Abraham, you will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, which meant exalted father, but you will be called Abraham, which means father of many. You fast forward to Genesis chapter 22 and you hear God say to Abraham, through your offspring, all nations on the earth will be blessed. Yes, God had a chosen people. Yes, their name was Israel. But God never intended not to bless all people. It was part of the story from the beginning. But here's the deal. The nation of Israel, people like Peter and others, had been raised with a worldview that excluded entire groups of people because they didn't have the same heritage that Peter had. They weren't welcome in the family. They would always be outsiders. 
If you have paid attention in the book of Acts, this has continually been a story of how God is welcoming outsiders in. From the time that Peter and John went to the temple in Acts chapter 3 and healed the lame man and brought him into the temple, to the time that Philip meets the Ethiopian eunuch on the road who doesn't completely understand what he's reading and invites the outsider in, The book of Acts is a story of God saying, I never intended for anybody to be on the outside. Which begs the question, friends, who have we been keeping on the outside that God has always intended to be in? What worldviews have we grown up with from childhood Because that's what we've been taught and what we've known. That God wants to say to us, it's time to reshape and redefine it. How do we know that that's what God is doing here? Because as Cornelius is worshiping the Lord, he also has a vision. An angel of the Lord speaks to him and says, listen, you need to send some people to go find Simon Peter and bring him back to the house because he has a message that you need to hear. So obedient, Cornelius sends some people, three messengers, a day and a half journey away to Joppa. And as they leave Cornelius' house, Peter's in Joppa doing his thing. And while they're journeying, he's up on the roof and he receives a vision. But God doesn't spell it out for Peter the way he spelled it out for Cornelius. Why? Because Peter has some worldviews that God needs to unpack and rearrange. So he gives him a picture. Wouldn't it have just been easier if God had said, Hey, Peter, Gentiles are in. It's okay. No, he gave him a vision to help him understand. Because it's not so much welcoming the outsiders in that God wanted to drive home with Peter. It's these words. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. If I could say it another way in today's vernacular, I might put it this way. Don't call anything abnormal that God has said is the new normal. Hold on to that for a minute. Because how many of you walk in the building on Sunday morning and go, this is not normal, what we're doing right now. This isn't, this isn't the way it should be. I granted the seating's a little weird. Granted, maybe the format of our worship is different, but what if, friends, what if this season where God has stripped away everything from us so we are really keenly aware that what we have and can cling to with confidence, the only thing that we have is Jesus. What if that is the new normal? Maybe we need to stop calling this season of life not normal. There's a running joke in our house, but I find it less funny and more accurate day by day. Steve says, normal is a setting on a washing machine. What is normal? Normal is what we call that makes us feel comfortable. Normal is what we call that fits into our paradigm and our box. So when I get pushed outside my box, you know what I say? This is not normal. This is not okay. Who in your life decides what's okay? Is it you? Because in this moment, what the Lord is saying to Peter is, I'm the one who decides what's okay. And as long as you and all of your rules decide that this is or isn't okay, you're going to miss out on a huge blessing. This is why this story in Acts is so pivotal. Because this is the moment where God says, hey, listen, I never intended for there to be outsiders. I never intended for anyone to be outside the reach of my grace and my goodness. I never intended for anyone not to receive the love and the abundance and the goodness and the affection and the mercy of God. Not one person. That wasn't my plan. If you don't believe me, go back to Jesus' words in the book of John. We all know it. We've known it from our childhood. We hold it up on posters at football stadiums. For God so loved the world. Not just Israel, friends. God loved the world. 
And while he may have identified a chosen people in the beginning through whom he would raise up a deliverer, he never excluded everybody. And this is the moment. This is the moment. And here's how you know. Because the Holy Spirit says to Peter, some guys have shown up from out of town. And when you see them and you figure out that they're not like you, everything in you is going to want to go, I'm not going. And I'm telling you right now, you need to go because I sent them to you. So here's the fast forward of part of the rest of the story. Peter does a couple of things that will shock and awe the audience that hears this story. Maybe not for us today, but the first thing he does is he invites them in to stay with him. Now, God's people were commanded to extend hospitality to foreigners and aliens, right? For them to, for, for Peter to bring someone he had previously considered unclean into the space of a home. Oh, by the way, it wasn't Peter's house. It was Simon the Tanner's house. So he's inviting somebody to stay with him in somebody else's house. Has that ever happened to you, by the way? Oh, it's okay. Go over to Marge's. You can stay with her. What? But that's exactly what happens. Not only does he engage with people who are unclean, if you dial it back to the book of John again, you'll remember a story where we find out Jews and Samaritans don't hang out, and it's when Jesus is talking to a woman at the well. Hey, Jesus, did you forget? Men don't talk to women, and Jews don't talk to Samaritans, so this is really weird right now. Peter invites them into his home, and then the next day they get up and they go back. They go back to the house of Cornelius, and Peter goes in the house and he says, Hey, I understand you sent for me. What is it you want? And Cornelius says, I had a vision. And God called for you to come to me because there's something that you have to say that we need to hear. And then, and then, friends, this is what Peter says in Acts chapter 10, verse 28. God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. That's a major fast forward from the night before when he's on the roof praying and God says, don't call anything impure that I have made clean. Fast forward a day and Peter's starting to pick up the pieces. Oh, this isn't about stuff, Lord. This isn't about food at all. This is about people. And I go back to the original question. What is it in your life, not stuff, but who are the people in your life that you have said, shouldn't be on the inside. And God has said, but I love the world. Who are they? Because if you're convinced that it's nobody, I think God wants you to dig a little deeper today. There are some worldviews that we've grown up with that have automatically put people groups on the outside. Not just of our worship, but of the way that we live, of the way that we share things, of the way that we care for one another, of the way that we demonstrate the gospel. He says to them, God's shown me I shouldn't call anyone impure or unclean. And then he says, I realize how true it is that God doesn't show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. In that moment, in that revelation on the rooftop, God says there's nobody on the outside anymore. Everybody is welcome in the family of God. But it took the obedience of Peter to go for that story. Can I just tell you why this is a big deal? Because we're Gentiles. Do you understand that what happened in Acts chapter 10 has a direct impact on us today? Because before then, we were all on the outside. But God so loved the world, and he said, I never intended for you to be on the outs. Well, come in. Come in. And so Peter stays at the home, forbidden by Jewish law. By the way, not forbidden by Scripture, but forbidden by Jewish law. And so here's the big question today I think the Lord wants us to wrestle with. And maybe it'll make you uncomfortable, and it's okay. Uncomfortability, friends, is the new normal. God is pushing you outside your box. And here's the question. What does God want to dismantle in you? What perspectives and worldviews does God want to change in you? Does he want to change prejudice in you? Does he want to change stubbornness 
in you. Because Peter was digging his heels in. I'm not eating that food, Lord. Does he want to dismantle selfishness in you? Does he want to dismantle piety in you? How you look on the outside instead of what's really happening on the inside. What does God want to dismantle in you? So when he says, I want you to do this, and you say, "Huh, uh Lord, that's not normal. And he says, wait a minute, I'm the one that decides what's okay. This is the new normal. What is it that God wants to dismantle in you? Because it could be what paves the way for something new to happen in the church and in the life of God's people. So I invite you today, just for a couple of moments, to sit and ask the Lord, what is it that you want to undo in me? How do you want to redeem my thinking? To create space, to create an opportunity for something new to be done in my heart and to be done in your church. Would you stand and sing with us?
his wounds have paid my ransom why should I gain from his reward I cannot give an answer but this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom I'm going to read from Psalm 36 verses 5 through 12 Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens Your faithfulness to the cloud Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of our arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky, and your righteousness is like the mighty mountain. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadows of your wings. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. And your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadows of your wings. I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadows of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Now we're going to do the offering, and as reminds you, there is a plate. plate. <laughs> that was an easy one. Um, up front, and I believe there's some in the back mm-hmm. as well. Um, so take this time to listen to your heart and do as God has um, laid upon you. Mm-hmm. So if you'll pray with me, please. Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful time together that we get to come and worship you. Um, Although it looks different, 
or it feels different, you are still the same. Amen. You haven't changed. Praise Your love for us is still the same, still mighty and magnificent. We ask you to use these gifts that we're going to give you today to help us further the work of your kingdom, to reach out to those, those that need more of you, mm. and to do that work through us, Lord. Yes. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. to the setting sun his love endures forever and by the grace of God we will carry on his love endures forever sing praise sing praise sing that God is with us forever. He's with us in this space and with us when we go. The challenge for us is to listen to the voice that's always with us, asking us the question, what is it in us that has been a limiter to people experiencing the presence of God? What is it that you were raised with? What was embedded in you deep from the beginning? Because here's the thing. Peter couldn't necessarily tell somebody was a Jew always from the outside. There were internal prejudices, perspectives that he had been raised with that caused him to see that if people didn't have certain markers, they weren't welcome. And God's invitation to us is to remember this. We don't always know by what we see on the outside, but it's how we've been judging. And God sent Christ for the whole world. Not just for a certain group of people. Not just for people that look like us once our lives have been changed. But for the people whose lives have not yet been changed. And you know the difference? Sometimes that shows up on the outside, but it's internal. So we have to start looking at people with new eyes. Maybe Peter had a moment, just like Saul and Ananias. And he received sight too. In a vision. To remind him that everyone was welcome in the family of God. As you go from this place today, don't run away from the challenge. Lean into the hard space of asking yourself the question. God wouldn't raise the question if it wasn't important. So lean into the hard space of the question. What is it that God wants to dismantle in me to make room for the new normal in the kingdom of God? Because if we all work together to do that, he will not just transform us. 
but he'll transform everyone around us. And isn't that the goal of the gospel anyway? Transformation for the world? Go now into all the world and carry the good news of Jesus Christ. You are loved.